Australian-British animal ethicist Dr Andrew Knight is a European veterinarian specialist in welfare science, ethics and law, and a fellow of the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics, which is dedicated to advancing the ethical status of animals through academic research, teaching and publication. Andrew has produced over 50 academic publications on animal issues. These include an extensive series examining the contributions of animal experiments to human health care, which formed the basis for his PhD and his book, The Costs and Benefits of Animal Experiments. Andrew's other publications have examined how the livestock sector contributes to climate change, vegetarian diets for companion animals, animal welfare standards for veterinarians, and the latest evidence about cognitive and related abilities and the resultant moral implications. Today, Dr. Knight will discuss animal sentience and the moral questions raised when conducting invasive experiments on animals. What do or should scientists think about when considering the ethics of animal experimentation? Well, there's a whole bunch of things scientists are supposed to consider. They're supposed to consider the research question they're trying to answer and whether the animal model that's been chosen is appropriate for investigating that research question. They're supposed to consider the numbers of animals used and whether uh, those are statistically valid for the particular type of study that's being done. They're supposed to consider things like uh, painkillers and husbandry strategies for ensuring that uh, the animal suffering is kept to the minimum possible level. They're supposed to consider whether alternative research strategies might be employed instead. But considering the ethics of conducting invasive research, they're supposed to weigh up the likely benefit of the research against the harms that are inflicted on the animals uh, subjected to the experiments. What is sentience? Well, sentience really refers to the ability of an animal to uh, sense, uh, to feel, uh, to perceive things, to have a variety of emotional states, uh, positive states and negative states, so things like uh, pain and suffering and distress, uh, things like pleasure and happiness and other positive states. Isn't this application of feelings to animals just a form of anthropomorphism? Well, it was thought for a long period of time, even decades, hundreds of years in fact, that animals don't really have any significant feelings and indeed this school of thought was often credited to the French philosopher and scientist René Descartes and he famously stated that the screaming of a dog subjected to an invasive animal experiment is no more morally significant than the squeaking of, an, of a piece of machinery that hasn't been adequately oiled. However, we now have so much information about animals from things like observational and behavioural studies that allow us to infer the existence of various psychological states such as happiness, uh, pleasure, pain, distress, jealousy and so on. We have information from neuroanatomical studies. We know that uh, various animal species have got things like uh, sensory nerve endings such as nociceptors which are designed to detect noxious stimuli. Uh, peripheral neuroanatomical architecture, central neuroanatomical architecture, various uh, an analogous brain structures uh, similar to those in human beings and things like uh, neurotransmitting chemicals. Uh, so they appear to have anatomically uh, very similar mechanisms to those involved in human uh, perception of pain, perception of other sensory information and also the places in the brain where human emotions are believed to reside. So they've got similar anatomy and finally we've got evolutionary biology which gives us uh, reasons why we think it likely that animals uh, experience states like pain, pleasure and other, other emotional states. For example, it's pain um, encourages or strongly motivates animals to avoid uh, things which are likely to damage their tissues. So uh, sensory nerve endings detect stimuli likely to cause mechanical damage to tissues, likely to cause thermal damage, electrical stimuli, chemical damage and provoke an avoidance reaction. So there is a very uh, strong set of reasons why animals have evolved to have these nervous systems to allow them to avoid things in their environments which are likely to cause them harm and perhaps even kill them. Similarly, uh, emotional states such as the 
very strong bonds that occur between dams or female animals and between newborn animals are likely to aid the survival of, of young animals. So there are very good reasons from evolutionary biology why uh, we think animals have developed mechanisms to be able to feel uh, things such as pain, detect a variety of sensory information and also to experience emotions. So when we put together uh, the reasoning that we have from evolutionary biology, the information from neuroanatomical studies of animals and finally the wealth of information we have from observational and behavioural studies of animals, then the, the position that animals do have emotional states seems far more plausible than the position that they don't. We'll never know for certain what goes in the minds of animals or indeed other people besides ourselves, but the position that animals don't uh, have those capacities and those feelings uh, seems f to fly in the face of all the evidence that we do have and to seem far less plausible than the position that they are sentient. If the choices between conducting an experiment on a non-human animal or a human Shouldn't we pick the non-human animal? Well, we don't consider it ethical to conduct invasive experiments on people without their consent to help other people. So the question is, is it ethical to conduct invasive experiments on animals? The first question is, why are we conducting those experiments? They're usually conducted to try to help people, to help human patients or human consumers, for example. And unfortunately, uh, the scientific evidence pretty clearly indicates that the vast majority of animal research conducted for those purposes does not end up having the positive benefits that are hoped for or expected. Actually, most of that, most of that research does not go on to help human patients or help human consumers, uh, contrary to what many people think. So, what about the question of conducting invasive research on animals to help other animals? Well, in that case, scientifically, it's a lot more valid to uh, experiment on a cat to help another cat is a lot more scientifically valid than to help a dog or help a human being. But then we come back to the moral question, is, is it moral to do that, to seriously harm or kill one cat to help another? I can't really see a reason why we think that's unacceptable in human beings, but it's acceptable in animals. So I don't actually think that that is ethical to conduct invasive research on animals for those reasons. But non-human animals are used by humans for all sorts of reasons that are socially acceptable, such as food, clothing and entertainment. So surely it's okay to use them this way. We do use literally tens of billions of animals around the world each year just for food. Animals are raised in, most commonly, uh, intensively farmed in conditions which severely restrict their movement. They have a variety of surgical mutilations conducted on them routinely as part of normal animal husbandry in modern intensive farms, often without any painkillers. They're, they're killed at a pr very premature stage of life in the frightening environment of a modern slaughterhouse. Animals uh, are used in entertainment today and have been in many countries in things like uh, uh, dog fighting, uh, bear baiting, bull fighting and a variety of other very cruel uses of animals. And the fact that all these things have occurred and have been considered acceptable in various societies and sometimes still are considered acceptable in societies today certainly isn't a valid reason I think for trying to justify other uses of animals which are seriously harmful for animals and not beneficial very much at all for people. So two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, just because terrible things are done to animals in other sectors of, of human society doesn't make this any more justifiable uh, in scientific research. But if experimenting on animals will save human lives, then isn't the suffering worth it? Well, what the scientific evidence very clearly demonstrates is that this research doesn't save human lives uh, very much at all. It's often claimed that this human research is vital to uh, preventing, curing or alleviating serious human diseases. But in recent years, uh, myself and other, other scientific colleagues have started to conduct large-scale studies of published animal experiments uh, in the scientific literature to look at how often those experiments do actually translate into cures for human patients. And what we found in a very large group of these studies is that the actual human benefits are uh, very rare or infrequent at best. So it's simply not true that this research generally does help human patients or benefit human consumers. Doesn't the law protect animals used in experiments from cruelty and pain? 
Well, animal experimentation in New Zealand is regulated under Part 6 of the Animal Welfare Act. And Part 6 of the Act specifically exempts animal research from the protections that are afforded to animals in other parts of the legislation, in other parts of society. So practices that would be considered illegal because of extreme cruelty are specifically exempted under Part 6. They're allowed to be inflicted on animals used for scientific research. But wouldn't the animal ethics committees prevent anything really painful from happening to the animals? Well, animal ethics committees are supposed to scrutinise animal research and ensure that only well-justified research proceeds and animals are protected from unreasonable harms and so on. The trouble is, uh, the reality, unfortunately, doesn't match up to the intentions at all. Um, ethics committees are supposed to have a researcher or representative from the research institution as well as a veterinarian from outside the institution, a representative from the Animal Welfare Society outside the institution and also someone designed to represent the views of the community. The trouble is there's no limits on the number of people from the research institution that are allowed onto the committee and so as a result some of these committees have very large numbers of people from the research institution uh, and only three people from outside the institution. So uh, bias in the committees is a huge problem. There have been studies documenting uh, really serious levels of bias in animal ethics committees in some other countries and there's no reason to believe that these problems don't occur inside New Zealand either. If animal experimentation is unethical, then what can be done instead? There's a whole range of non-animal research methods that can be considered. There's, for example, a wide variety of cell culture assays. We can use protozoa, yeast, uh, bacteria, mammals and even human cell cultures to try and predict a range of toxicities. We can use them individually or combined as batteries to increase the range of toxins that are detected. We can use them static or perfuse them with solutions to measure things like the uh, timing of toxicity, the onset of toxicity, the duration of toxicity and so on. There's a range of uh, things like various computer simulations that include things like structure activity relationships and expert systems. Both of those simply mean uh, programs that allow us to try to predict biological activities such as various toxicities on the basis of things like chemical structure of the compound being investigated. There's a range of uh, advanced imaging modalities, uh, MRI scans, CTs, many others. Uh, there are gene chips which are cDNA microarrays and what they do is they allow us to detect changes in genomes uh, prior to um, changes starting to affect uh, the entire cell or the entire organ or the entire animal or person if uh, the cells have been exposed to a drug or a toxin or a chemical. So they allow uh, results to be obtained much more quickly and much less invasively for the animal or indeed the person. There are um, modernised um, human clinical trials that try to increase the predictivity of limited human clinical trials for much wider populations of human patients and also try to increase the safety of these clinical trials as well for the human volunteers. Uh, we can use uh, human-based studies in other ways such as using surrogate human tissues, for example uh, placental tissue obtained during childbirth has mast cells in it that have a functional cellular receptor for nerve growth factor. So that allows us to actually conduct uh, neurological experiments and neuropharmacological and toxicological experiments on placental tissue rather than actually using uh, nerve tissue. So that's an example of using surrogate human tissues. So there, there are a whole range of uh, non-animal methods that can be considered. In fact, I've got a, an 11,000 word chapter in my book here, The Costs and Benefits of Animal Experiments, just answering that question. Uh, what are the non-animal methods that can be considered instead of animal research. Now of course these methods are not yet capable of answering all questions about human beings, uh, particularly given present technological limitations. But the same criticism of course is certainly true of animal models which have a much more limited capacity for further development. It's also true of course that when we use human cells and human tissues, human volunteers, we're able to obtain our results usually much more quickly, much more predictive for human patients. Results that give us much better insights into human biological processes as well. What is the way forward for the ethical scientist? Well I think ethical scientists have to not consider just whether something can be done but whether it should be done. Things like how likely is the research to actually produce tangible benefits, not just a vague possibility of benefits some point in, in the far future 
but actual real tangible concrete benefits to things like human patients, human society in the short to medium term future and also start to look at really what are the costs. Animals aren't simply disposable research objects, they have lives that matter to them and those lives are intrinsically valuable and it matters morally when we destroy those lives. So I think we have to start looking more seriously at what are the costs of this research, both in terms of animal lives, in terms of the vast consumption of scientific and financial resources that this, this research does tend to consume compared to some other fields of scientific research, and start to make decisions about what is the most responsible way to be spending our limited scientific resources, our financial resources, and of course the most ethical way to deal with the lives of the research animals, of the lives of human patients and consumers that are going to be affected by the outcomes of this research. Andrew's informational websites include animalexperiments.info, humanelearning.info, animalconsultants.org and oxfordanimalethics.com.